for a very long time. Um, that's all you need to know. Uh, <laughs> because our, we have a very interesting panel, the second panel to come up today, that I think is, um, uh, it'll be uh, most interesting to those who are interested in Scalia. Um, we have people who are, a couple of people who are, um, have qualified to give us uh, authoritative uh, accounts of Scalia's outlook on American constitutional okay. aspects of it. And uh, we're very fortunate in that. We only have two speakers today. Uh, the third speaker, a man named Scott Martin, uh, unfortunately cannot make it. We have two speakers today. Brian Fitzpatrick, uh, who's a professor of law at uh, Vanderbilt uh, Law School, and his research for support, uh, focuses on class litigation, federal courts, judicial selection, and constitutional law. He graduated first in his class from Harvard Law School and clerked for Justice Antonin Scalia in the October <coughs> 2001 term. He will go first. Our second speaker will be um, Ian Samuel. Uh, who is a law clerk for Justice Scalia in the October term of 2012 and is cur currently a lecturer on law at Harvard Law School. Before his service in the Justice Chambers, uh, Ian served for three years in the United States Department of Justice in the appellate staff of the Civil Division and Office of the Solicitor General. He also worked for three years in the appellate litigation firm, a group at Jones Day University. <coughs> he got his law degree at NYU. Now, there are only two speakers today. Uh, in this class instead of three, so we have a little more time. But the way I, what I propose to do is to let each of our speakers uh, go in turn for about somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes. So you have some latitude there. <coughs> uh, but, but at 30 minutes, I'm going to start reading the bell. Okay. Uh, on, on, you know, so be aware of that. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, then I will, uh, after they've each spoken, I will give them a chance to uh, talk to each other. Uh, uh, for a few minutes, uh, they wanted to comment on the other's papers, you see, you know, back and forth for a few minutes, and so maybe for 10 or 15 minutes, depending on the time. And after that, I will throw the, uh, uh, the whole floor open to the audience and allow you to ask questions. Uh, about the so that is the plan for today. Uh, our first speaker is going to be uh, Brian Fitzpatrick, and um, uh, the title of your paper is, uh, uh, let's see, um, uh, Just No. Um, right behind you. Yeah, there it is. Okay. There's the title. You don't need me anymore. I'll sit down and get out of the way. Thank you all very much. It's a real honor and, and pleasure uh, to be here today. Um, I, I do feel very much at home here. I'm, I'm part Italian and part Irish, and so uh, I feel a lot of ethnic pride uh, being in the room uh, today. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about Justice uh, Scalia's um, legacy as an Italian-American. Instead, I'm going to talk about his legacy as a jurist and really a legal philosopher. I was a law clerk to him uh, 15 years ago. Um, each justice has four law clerks. They stay for one year. You usually are hired shortly after law school, and you help the justice uh, prepare for arguments, <coughs> draft opinions, um, you help the justices decide which cases for the Supreme Court to accept. The Supreme Court gets 10,000 requests every year to take cases from the lower courts. They only take 75, so someone has to wade through the 10,000. Say it's not the justices. <laughs> uh, and, and so the, the law clerks uh, help the justices in, in various uh, ways, and so you get a first hand opportunity uh, to see how the court works and uh, certainly to see how Justice uh, Scalia uh, works. So, um, you know, I'm obviously biased uh, in favor of uh, Justice Scalia. I admired him a great, great deal. He was a very um, uh, influential person on me, um, both as a law student and once I became one of his law clerks. Uh, but I, I think even when I put my objective hat on, there's very little doubt that Justice Scalia um, is already 
one of the most influential justices in the history of the United States Supreme Court. And I think there's a very good case to be made that he will continue for a very long time to be known as one of the most influential justices. I think you even make a case that he is already the most influential justice in the United States history. Uh, but we can talk a little bit more about that at the end. I want to um, describe to you a few aspects of his legacy uh, and then give you some evidence for his influence. Um, so the first thing that you need to know about the justices jurisprudential legacy is he is a proponent of what is known as judicial restraint. And this is a very old school of thought in American political science and political theory. Some people would say from the very beginning of the country, people have been worried about federal judges who have life tenure, who are not elected. People have been worried since the very beginning that they would do whatever they want to do <coughs> instead of follow the law. This has been a, a concern of ours from the very <coughs> beginning, some people would say. It certainly became a very big concern of ours in the 20th century. <coughs> there was a legal movement in the 20th century called legal realism, uh, which um, really persuaded most people that um, Law is something that is created by either the legislature or judges. Before that, most people were natural law people, and they thought the law was kind of self-evident um, in, the, in the sky, is what you know, a famous judge, um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, would, would criticize natural law people by saying, they look in the sky, they see the, the legal principles up there. Uh, once the legal realists came on the scene in the early 1900s and persuaded people, you know, the law's not up there, something that's created, something that's made by people. There are no necessary laws. Uh, we decide what laws that we will live by. So once people became legal realists, then people really started to worry about this. Because if the judges aren't just finding laws that pre-existed, but in fact they could be making laws, uh, what authority do unelected, life-tenured federal judges have to make law for the rest of us? We're supposed to be living in democracy. So people have been worried about judicial restraint for a, for a very long time. And people have been trying to find a way to cabin the discretion of federal judges. So they're just not making policy decisions for the rest of us, because that's what we're supposed to make for ourselves those decisions in a democracy. So that, this has been a long school of thought. Justice Scalia has been a very influential justice because he picked up this concern about judicial restraint and he figured out a way to actually operationalize what it meant for judges to be restrained. And he, he, he did not invent these theories as we discussed earlier. But he became very power, the most powerful spokesperson for these two theories of interpreting a text called textualism and originalism. And the theories are basically the same. We usually refer to textualism as interpretation of statutes and originalism as interpretation of the Constitution. But they're really the same theory. And what he said was this. If a judge is interpreting a text, whether a statute or the Constitution, if the judge sticks to what the people who were around when that text was enacted thought those words meant. If the judge sticks to those meanings, the judge is interpreting the law. If the judge wants to update those meanings, to read new meanings into the text, to deviate from the people who wrote the texts and who were around the time of that thought they were doing, if judges want to update the meaning, then judges are no longer interpreting the law. They are now making the law. So the line between interpretation and lawmaking was are you sticking to the original understanding of the words or are you giving new meanings to those words? He said, if you want to give new meanings to the words, there's a way to do that. You can amend the law, change the statute, amend the Constitution. Don't ask me, an unelected judge, to do your work for you. 
by giving these words that had an old meaning and a new meaning. You do that yourself for the democratic process. That was his theory, and it was a simple and elegant way to determine who's an activist judge and who's a restrained judge, who is following the law and who is going beyond their judicial duty and making the law. So it was a simple and elegant theory um, to really operationalize this long concern in American history about judicial restraint. And uh, the theory has been incredibly influential on judges, on legal academics, and on the public. And I'm going to go through some metrics about why these theories of textualism and originalism have been so influential. I'm going to show you some evidence on how Scalia has been so influential. But before I do that, I want to say a word about why the justice was so effective. Um, he didn't invent these theories, as I said. But he was a very charismatic, shrewd, and powerful <laughs> spokesperson for these ideas. The justice did not see himself simply as a judge. The justice saw himself as a legal philosopher, and he saw himself as an activist for his ideas, his ideas which were against judicial activism. He was an activist against judicial activism. But he really saw himself as an evangelist for these ideas. And so he didn't just write opinions. He wrote books. He wrote law review articles. He went around the country all the time. He was traveling all the time to give speeches. He was trying to persuade not just the litigants in front of him, not just his colleagues, not just lawyers, lay people, politicians, policymakers, that this is how we can tell the difference between a restrained judge and an activist judge. He was uh, very concerned about democracy and the power of the people to make decisions for themselves as opposed to having decisions imposed upon them by unelected judges. And he went around the country trying to persuade people of that. He was a philosopher more than he was a judge. And, and, I, and I want to uh, take a moment to um, clarify the record of something I said earlier today. We got some questions about it at lunch. I, I, uh, we were talking about Justice Thomas and Justice Scalia earlier. And uh, I said Justice Thomas was not an intellectual and Justice Scalia was. I did not mean by that that Justice Thomas was not a very bright jurist, a very bright lawyer. He is. I just mean that Justice Thomas is less interested uh, in <coughs> philosophy of law, and he's more interested in being a good judge. Justice Scalia was interested in being a good judge, but he also wanted to change people's hearts and minds about what it was to be a restrained judge and what it meant to interpret the law. He was interested in the bigger picture. He spent a lot of time in the bigger picture. It's also a reason why he was so provocative in his speeches, in his opinions, in his books and articles. As we all know, he had a very sharp pen, a very sharp tongue. And there was a method to his madness. And the method was he wanted people to pay attention to him. <coughs> and he knew that if he was provocative, they would. And he was right. And we're going to see some evidence of that, too, that people paid attention to Justice Scalia and what he had to say because he was so provocative. And, and now a lot of people have criticized him for being so provocative. They say that he ushered in an era of lack of civility on the bench. Um, and, you know, I, I think reasonable people can disagree about whether he was too provocative, too undiplomatic. Some people worry that he pushed away some of the moderate justices, like O'Connor and Kennedy, by criticizing them so sharply. Some people worry about that. I didn't see any evidence of that in the one year I was there, but I was only there for one year. Uh, so reasonable people can disagree about whether he ended up hurting himself or helping himself in the end by being so provocative. But I will say it did get him a lot of attention for his ideas. Um, and I want to contrast that. I want to contrast Justice Scalia's ideas about how we should interpret the law and the proper role of a judge in our society with another way in which other justices are often very influential, and that is winning the big cases. 
So a lot of the most famous Supreme Court justices uh, had a role in deciding landmark U.S. Supreme Court cases or had a role in um, putting together coalitions of justices to decide series of important cases. Justice Scalia is not going to be influential in, in the history of the court because he won big cases. He was, he's, often on the, he's often on the losing side of the big cases. His influence is not the win-loss record in the cases. His influence is in changing how people think about the law and about judges. And I would submit to you, and I'm going to today, that's a much more lasting contribution than whether you're on the right side of a 5-4 vote in one case, which can be overturned next year. It's a more lasting change from hearts and minds about law and about judges. So um, I want to go through some evidence of why I think the justice has been so influential in changing people's hearts and minds about how to interpret the law and how judges should do their job. So the first uh, piece of evidence that I want to talk about is the role that Justice Scalia and his theories had in the judiciary. And so here's a graph. Uh, some scholars have calculated how often the U.S. Supreme Court cites to dictionaries in their opinions. Now, why is that important? Well, because Justice Scalia's view is the words mean what people at the time those words were enacted thought they meant. Well, how do you figure out what people at the time thought words meant? You go to dictionaries that were published at that time to get the ordinary public understanding of the words. So um, these calculations were done by decade, not by year, and so they're a little um, uh, clunky in the way that they are shown on the graph. But basically, before Scalia enters the picture, the Supreme Court did not cite the dictionaries very frequently in their opinions. <coughs> and in the decades after that he, he's been on the court, the citations to dictionaries go way up, way up. Um, he was persuading his colleagues uh, that they needed to use different methods to interpret the law. Instead of doing whatever they wanted to do, updating statutes, they should try to find the original meaning of those words when the statute was enacted. These calculations on citations to dictionaries are robust even if you remove Justice Scalia's own opinions from the set of the date. And, and uh, his other, his, the other justices, his colleagues, <laughs> even the ones that were there before he got there, changed their own behavior in the years after he was there. And you can see the exact same thing in the opposite direction with regard to legislative history. The squiggly line is year by year instead of decade by decade. This is how often the Supreme Court cites legislative history in deciding what the words of a statute means. This is thought of as an anti-Scalia-esque practice because instead of relying on the ordinary public understanding of the words, the courts, when they cite legislative history, are relying on what one legislator might have said the words meant and that may not comport with what the public understanding of those words are. And one legislator that cannot speak for, in, in the U.S. House, 435 people, for, for example. Um, and so Scalia always criticized this practice of using legislative history. And you can see that after he joins the court, the, uh, the citations to legislative history go down in the U.S. Supreme Court. And, um, uh, Again, these results are robust even to take Scalia's own opinions out. And in fact, the biggest change in legislative history citation that, that the scholars found who did this empirical work, the biggest change to a member of the court before and after Scalia was Justice O'Connor. Justice O'Connor used to cite a lot, a lot of legislative history before Scalia joined her, and then after he joined her, her citations to legislative history went down. And so you can see on the Supreme Court real evidence that his presence was changing people's behavior and bringing people towards his views. You can see the same thing with regard to originalist materials. So instead of dictionaries and legislative history, originalists, people who are trying to understand the original understanding of the U.S. Constitution, they often turn to the Federalist Papers to glean meaning to the words in the Constitution. 
And you see the same thing after Scalia joins. So this again is decade by decade, so it's a little clunky. Um, you know, in the in the decades before Scalia is there, they don't ever cite the, the Federalist Papers, not very often. In the decades since he's been there, the citations to the Federalist Papers go way up, not only because of his opinions, but because of the opinions of his colleagues. So there's real data to support this. We could do these exact same graphs, not only looking at the U.S. Supreme Court opinions, we could also <laughs> look at lower court opinions, the district court <coughs> judges, the courts of appeals. Their citations to dictionaries are way up. Their citations to legislative history are way down. Their citations to the Federalist Papers and things like that are up as well. So he's had an impact in the lower courts as well as the U.S. Supreme Court. And in fact, on this point of the lower courts, here is a, um, a study that was done by a political scientist who is uh, almost as famous as Professor Siegel, not, not quite, Great Cross. Um, and uh, he... Uh, looked at how often opinions written by the various Supreme Court justices are cited in the lower courts. So how often a lower <coughs> court judge chooses to cite an opinion written by each of the justices. And you see again, during this 10 year time period that Frank Cross examined it, Justice Scalia beats all the others. Judges, lower court judges are gravitating to what he says, to what his opinions are. And I just, I love the title of, of Professor Cross's Law Review article here, I don't know if you can see it back there, but it's Determinants of Citations to Supreme Court Opinions, parenthesis, and the Remarkable Influence of Justice Scalia. He is, people pay attention to what he says in a way they just don't with regard to other Supreme Court justices. Um, what about the Academy? So, originalism and textualism are doing well in our courts. Um, what about the academy? Well, there's no doubt that Justice Scalia's views are still a very small minority in legal academia. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. But uh, adherence to his views have really grown. I think when Justice Scalia joined the court in 1986, you know, he had been an academic before he became a judge. He, at the University of Chicago Law School and the University of Virginia Law School. When he joined the court, I think there were maybe two academics that we might call originalists, Robert Bork and Justice Scalia. Uh, now there are dozens and dozens at the top law schools in, in included. Uh, there are two academic centers, very well endowed, uh, who uh, that have devoted themselves <coughs> just to the study of originalism. There's one at Georgetown and one at the University of San Diego. So the theories are growing even in the academy. But more <coughs> than the number of adherents to originalism and textualism, the one thing that Scalia has done throughout the academy, even though the numbers of people who agree with him are still small in the academy, what he has done is he's completely dominated the debate in the academy over constitutional theory. So I was at a workshop two weeks ago at Vanderbilt. We had a professor come in from Georgetown Law School named Larry Solom, very prominent law professor. Um, and this, he gave us a paper, and this was one of the first sentences in his paper. Perhaps the most important debates in contemporary constitutional theory cluster around the disputes between originalists and living constitutionalists. These are Living constitutionals are basically anyone who's not an original. The most important debates today are between Justice Scalia and his adherents and everyone else. Um, so he is, his theories dominate the discussion of constitutional theory. People are grappling with him, even if they don't agree with him. They are grappling with him um, in a way they're just not grappling with anything that other justices uh, say or do. This right here is some data on these points. Um, this uh, was um, an attempt to assess how long, uh, how long, how often each of the U.S. Supreme Court justices had their works of scholarship. So this is just scholarship written by the justices. How often did other scholars, did law review professors, cite scholarship written by the justices. As I told you, Scalia's written books, he's written articles, he's, he's, he was a scholar before he became a judge. Where does he rank 
among all the other justices in terms of having their scholarship cited. He was number four behind some pretty big names. Oliver Wendell Holmes, William Brennan, Justice Frankfurt. They were the only ones that who's had scholarship cited by law professors in their articles more frequent on those. And I think that if this study were to be brought to look not just at scholarship, but just look at how often law reviews discuss the theories of the various justices, I think Scalia would look even better on this than, than he does. But he certainly looks good already um, uh, on, this, on this chart. Um, lastly, I want to talk about the public. So I think the justice has been very influential in the judiciary. I think he's been very influential in the academy. But frankly, I think his theories have been most influential of all in the general public, in the hearts and minds <coughs> of lay people, and in the political process. And it's hard to prove this. It's hard to prove that the justice has been influential in the public. I'm going to give you my best shot at one way in which he has. Um, if you ask people to name a Supreme Court justice, he's not number one. No, he's like maybe number four. Um, but uh, Paris <laughs> Thomas is still number one, I think. Uh, but um, there are some other ways we can see his influence among the public. And I, I think the way that um, speaks to me most clearly is if you ask lay people or politicians, how should a, du a judge do their job? Should a judge update the meaning to reflect contemporary preferences, or should the judge stick to the original meaning and wait for the democratic <coughs> process to amend the law? If you ask people that question, when people talk about how judges should behave, everyone today talks about judges as if they were Justice Scalia. In the political process, I'm going to show you the, the process for, the US con uh, 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 for confirmation in the U.S. Senate of federal judges. When judges are asked, how are you going to do your job? They all sound like Justice Scalia now. And it didn't used to always be that way. And here's some evidence of that. I'm going to show you some quotations from some U.S. Senate confirmation hearings in 1979 versus 2010. Okay, so let's start in 79. In 1979, a nominee not to the U.S. Supreme Court, this is a nominee to the Ninth Circuit, the, the judge that was under examination <coughs> here, his name was Harry, is Harry Pregerson. And William, or uh, 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 Senator Simpson, I forget what Senator Simpson from Wyoming his first name is, but Alan. Alan, Alan Simpson. He was the chair of the Judiciary Committee at <coughs> this time. And so he asked this question to the nominee before the Senate. He says, if a decision in a case was required by case law or statute, if a decision in a case is required by the law, and yet your conscience told you something different, what would you do? Harry Pregerson, God bless him, very honest man. He said, if I was faced with that, I'd follow my conscience, not the law. I would follow my conscience, not the law. Harry Pregerson was confirmed overwhelmingly by the oh. United States Senate. I don't think there was a dissent. Overwhelming. This is what people said in 1979 about how they would perform as an unelected, life-tenured judge. Fast forward to the post-Scalia era, 2010, Elena Kagan came before the United States Senate, and she was asked some very similar questions about what she would do if the original understanding of the Constitution was clear, or her conscience or contemporary values said something different, what would she do? And this is what Elena Kagan... <laughs> I had to say in 2010, we are all Already originalists class. now. <laughs> That's from Elena Kagan's mouth. We are all originalists now. That's the difference that Justice Scalia has made to this discussion in the public's eye. So he's been very influential. One question is, will his influence last? And I think there is every reason to think that it will. He has left behind <coughs> some very memorable opinions. In law school, the case books, what we call our textbooks, case books, they're filled of cases and opinions from 
judges. Justice Scalia's are always the favorites to be placed into our textbooks because they're so provocative and interesting. Uh, so he's got his opinions he's left behind, he has his books, his law review articles, his speeches that he's left behind, those things will continue. But he's left behind something else that I don't, I'm not sure how many people are aware of. But one of the things that Justice Scalia did when he was a law professor was he started an organization called the Federalist Society. This organization is now 40 or 50,000 lawyers strong. It's a very influential organization in Washington, D.C. over judicial nominations and, and education about legal and jurisprudential issues. Um, Justice Scalia started this organization when he was a law professor. At Chicago, he started it also with a, with a few others. I think maybe Mark too was one of the founding members of it. But the organization is basically dedicated to Justice Scalia's theories. And this organization has, has grown and grown and grown. Like I said, 40, 50,000 lawyers are now. The organization has a huge budget. It's going to continue indefinitely to promote Justice Scalia's theories even after he is gone. And so he's the only justice that has a 50,000 person organization dedicated to his ideas. And so for that reason, I think his influence uh, will last a very, very long time. Uh, where exactly would I rank him in terms of how influential he has been? Um, it's really hard for me to find any justices that have had a greater effect on how we think about the law and how we think about judges in our society, besides perhaps some of those legal realists. Those legal realists that I referred to at the beginning of the 1900s, they were Oliver Wendell Holmes, for example, they really had a dramatic influence on um, how we see things today. The only way in which Scalia might even better them, however, is that there were a lot of legal realists. It was not just Oliver Wendell Holmes, Brandeis, and a whole bunch of other people in the academy as well. Scalia <laughs> has largely been a one-man show when it comes to his ideas about original protection. There have been others working in the field, but he has really been stealing all, he had stole, stole a lot of the limelight. He was the most powerful spokesperson of his ideas. So I think he gets a lion's <coughs> share of the credit for the transformations he has made, whereas the legal realists have to share a lot of the credit amongst themselves. And so I think there is a case that can be made that he is the <coughs> most influential justice we've had, but certainly he is among the handful of the most uh, influential. Thank you very much.